Before the next episode of XJob Downloaded starts, I have a big favour to ask. If you've enjoyed any of our episodes so far, please can you click on the follow button on your platform. I'm on Apple, Spotify, Google, Amazon and YouTube. It costs nothing to follow, but makes a real difference to me as a podcast producer. Thank you. This week's podcast contains graphic and extreme detail. We discuss death and body recovery. If you're affected by any of the subjects within this podcast, then please refer to the organisations shown in the body of the podcast text. Thank you. My name is Paul Maleri, and for 30 years I served with Essex Police. During this time I interviewed suspects for murder, abduction, rape and extortion, plus a variety of other crimes. Now I interview former police and military personnel and anybody else who has an interesting story to tell. Sit back and listen to X Job Downloaded. This interview is being tape recorded. My name is Paul Maleri and this is X Job Downloaded. And today I'm going to interview Mick Baker. Now, Mick is a former member of the military and went on to join with the British Police Service. Now, this is an unusual one for me because whilst I know very little about most of my uh, contributors, I know absolutely nothing about you, Michael. So thank you so much for your time today and thanks for taking part in this. No, thank you. <laughs> so my opening Gambit, opening question is, where did it all begin for you and what was your inspiration to join the military and then go on and join the police? Um, okay, so as a kid, um, I always wanted to be a soldier. I, I just wanted to do that all my life. I watched far too many Vietnam War movies because <laughs> um, <laughs> um, that was the thing back in my day, as you remember yourself. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, um, yeah, I was that person that was the... Um, yeah, I wanted to be the soldier. I wanted to. Uh, I wanted to be a medic. That's what I wanted to do from very early on. Um, you know, the, the person gets shot, shouts medic. You know, and that was me really. You know, put your bag on, run over, and, and help someone. So that's what I did. Um, so I grew up in. Uh, well, I, I was born in Maidstone, but I actually moved to Ashford. So my formative years, if you like, were Ashford and Kent. Um, and I went on a first aid course actually when I was. Um, I had a girlfriend who lived opposite a uh, British Red Cross um, sort of base or whatever you call it, and uh, she worked later than me. So um, they did, I think it was on like a Wednesday night or something, like an hour, you could do a first day course for free. So I thought, well, that'll do, you know, I'll do a bit of that. Um, and I passed that course, you know, sort of give me the bug if you like. Um, and then, um, yeah, at 17, I thought, well, I really want to join the military, but do I want to join full time I don't know you know because it's, it's a commitment I mean you've got to you know, I mean back in my day it was at least three years yeah um and then I sort of uh, there was a TA base uh well in Maidstone but they had a section at Ashford and um I thought well oh, you know I could kind of join there so they had a, a medical sort of bit there so I joined them um absolutely loved it I couldn't get enough of it um uh I remember actually a, a little funny, a little funny for you, if you like. So when I was there, it was like 1991. And so you had the first Gulf War. If you yeah, you did. Remember that. Um, and the base I was in where this little section of medics were, well, that was only about half a dozen or something. Um, they, it was a, a Remy base, which the Royal Electrical Mechanical and Engineers. So it's um, uh, trucks and stuff like that, you know, and fixing them up. Yeah. And, um, yeah, they were spraying all these vehicles, you know, making them desert colour because if it was green, obviously. Yeah. And, um, they were so scared that there was going to be a, what, you know, what is now quite common, but then wasn't a thing, a suicide bombing. And um, they really thought that was going to be a thing. So they wanted people to guard the front gate. And we were allowed to do that, even though it's a medical corps, you're not allowed to do that sort of thing unless it's a medical base you're defending. Right. Um, but we, they sort of got around that and said, oh, you know, it's a few quid here. And I was 17, so it was like, yeah, all right. Because I was 17, they would give me a bullet. So I was, I was No. 
<laughs> with a SMG, which is a, a very old. Uh, you remember the Sten gun? It's like years ago in the Second World War. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, it comes out. Built one, of, one of them. Um, um, and I stood there on my own, just letting vehicles in. I had no idea what I was doing. I was 17 years old with a gun with no bullets in it. I mean, no bullets. So, looking back now, um, but that's what I did anyway. So that was um, that was that. <laughs> anyway, I joined the military. Um, Obviously, kid when I joined, obviously. Um, well, I was that kid, I was an adult officially, I suppose, but um, joined that, absolutely loved it. Um, joined the medical corps. Um, I went to my basic training, was in ATR uh, Litchfield up in Staffordshire. Yep. Um, weirdly, I actually won the best recruit award. Um, I think I got that by default, to be fair. Why? Because. Um, to be fair, there was not a lot of us got through in our platoon, and the person that probably should have got it um, <laughs> had a negative discharge the day before um, oh. on our final weapons test, and they couldn't give it to him, I think. So they pretty much, I thought, I, I mean, he should have got it. I mean, he really should, but I think I got it. <laughs> a bit of default. So, um, but it was a very proud, proud day for me to get that because, you know, you're marching out in front of, um, you know, friends and family and, you know, um, some general come down and give you a award on the parade ground and, you know, in front of everyone. It was a good, massive pulse out parade and it was really good. So enjoyed that. Went to Keo Barracks in um, just outside uh, Aldershot. Um, did my trade training, which is the medic training. Yep. That was, that was full on. I mean, that was, it was good, but it was full on. Um, yeah, it, it taught you a huge amount of stuff. That, I mean, I'll, I'll give the military, you know, I kick up the bum when I want to, but the military medical training was at the time really good. Yeah. Um, it was it was hench. <laughs> it was pretty full on. So yeah, that was my um, post through there to uh, full field ambulance in old shop, and uh, yeah, that was my my medical um, basis, if you like. So yeah, that's fantastic. That's How long did you serve in the military? Um, in all eight years. Right. Um, but I transferred to uh, the military police. <laughs> oh, did you? Yeah. Um, so um, in a so I was about three, four years in, I guess. Um, probably about three and a half, something like that. Um, and I applied to to be a. This is going to sound so weird. I applied to be a nurse. <laughs> no, I get it. Um, and it was purely because um, I was thinking forward. You know, thinking of where are you going from here. You know, and um, in the medical corps, you did some really advanced stuff where you were qualified for nothing. Yeah. Um, outside, I mean, inside, I mean, I could shove tubes down people's throat. I could sew people up. I could put, you know, yeah. like, uh, intravenous drips inside you, but I couldn't outside. That didn't actually mean anything, weirdly. So I thought, oh, there was a program going around at the time where they were recruiting directly um, inside rather than outside, because they've always, they always got the medical people, nurses, doctors, et cetera, from outside, yeah. um, and brought them in, then give them a lot of money and, and you know, use them. Um, but I think that would, there was a thing where they were sort of um, doing it inside, you know, um, and giving people within the armed medical service at the time, or within the military, um, the opportunity to be a nurse. So I, I took the opportunity, I thought, yeah, I'll do it. So I went on attachment to uh, the Dutch of... Came out, so I think it's the Dutch Kemp Medical Hospital, I think it was in Catterick. Um, went up there, I got assessed, etc. And I, I managed to pass, so that was really good. Um, went back so did you uni. become a fully fledged QA then? No, no, this is where I went wrong. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I went back to my, my barracks. Um, excuse me, um, and they pretty much treated me like crap. Um, because I was transferring out, so they put a lot of investment in me and didn't want me to go. So, um, but I didn't care because it was like I can't remember what time of year it was. I mean, maybe June. Um, and I I started in the university year of um, in September. Right. So I, thought, I can put up with that, but like, you know that's fine. So it's, it, August coming on. I mean, I was doing crap jobs. I was always on guard, sweeping you know floors. It was crap. You know, I was, all my friends were going off doing attachments here. Helicopter ambulance and ambulances and all these great horses and me, I'm sweeping a parade ground. So they're just punishing me. And um, I thought, you know, I can do that. 
And then I got called in one day um, by the training officer, who, who's actually a funny enough nurse herself, and she said to me, you know, Captain, she said, look, you know, you still got it, not a problem, but we are putting it off for a year. So I was like, oh, you know, what am I going to do? Can I do this for another year? So that night, um, went back to my room. Um, I thought I'd, I'd go and get myself a Chinese. <laughs> so I walked downtown, having to think about stuff, you know. Can I do this for another year and do that? Or do I just go back into what I'm doing? Or do I do something else? And essentially, I walked downtown and there was a couple of um, uh, military police cars went past me on blues. Um, and I thought, oh, that's interesting, you know. You know, you don't really see that a lot. And I went downtown, and basically it was a massive rock going down outside yeah. some pub. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just with them involved, the uh, sorry, uh, Hampshire police involved. It was just all going down. I thought, that's really exciting. You know, I wouldn't mind a bit of that. And I'm being treated like shite anyway. And also, uh, the more I looked into it after that, because I did look into it, um, 160, which was a provost unit just up the road from where I, from yeah. where I worked. Um, I got an attachment there for a week. Um, and absolutely loved it. I mean, I thought, oh, it was just amazing, you know, going around and doing what they did. Um, they were the power of Provost at the time, so they were the parachute. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, it was it was good. I enjoyed that, really loved it. And then, yeah, applied to join the Mitchell Blues. So, um, yeah, joined them in, in 96, I think it was. Yeah. So, what section yeah. did you go to? Sorry? What section did you go to? Um, initially, I went to Chichester to do my training. Yeah. Um, I finished that, and they posted me straight out to Northern Ireland. So I went. <laughs> I, went to, I spent two years in what was one seven six, um, Provost Company in Londonderry, and that changed to eight EPU. Um, and then um, the piece was all coming in at that sort of time, and it got closed down actually. So um, yeah, they kept us there for a little bit longer than they probably should have. Done. Um, but yeah, I spent two and just over two years there. So, oh wow! Uh, and, and where yeah. did you go after that? I went to Colchester after that. Five, six. Five, six. Five, who, five, six. who was the RSM there then? Oh, Christ, you know, but I can tell you. My what year was that, 98? No, that would have been, uh, no, that would have been 99. I went there in 99. Um, oh, yeah, uh, I, I, I had Sam Appleyard as my... Oh, um, Sam, big Sam Appleyard. Yeah, big fella, big fella. Um, he was my um, staff sergeant. Um yeah, great bunch of people. Really, really loved it there. Probably, uh, I mean, um, I loved Londonderry. Londonderry was an amazing place to be. Um, it, we worked hard, played hard, and it was, you know, great bunch of guys and girls there. Really, really were. Um, and some of them probably see this on my not Facebook or whatever, but they really were great people. Um, it, was, it was hard there. But um, we really did, you know, we <laughs> had some good parties, as we were, um, let our hair down a lot. Um, but yeah, went to Colchester, great, amazing place, uh, 156, really enjoyed it. Um, I was married at the time, so um, yeah, I um, we went through some real trials going through that um, whole time, to be honest. I mean, I got married in... Um, Oh, God, 94, something like that. Um, and, um, yeah, it was a really, really bad time throughout the marriage. And and, and there's no blame there. I'm not going to blame my ex or anything like that. It was just no. a really bad time. Um, yeah, sorry, I shouldn't swear. I do apologise. No, it's all right. Um, but, um, yeah, but, so if I, look, I had to leave the army, really. Um, I really, really, since day, really regret that. Uh, yeah, I do. Um I, I hear all the horror stories of army and whatever, but to be fair, um, the army always looked out, out for me. They always looked out yeah. for me. Um, they did. Um, it was just a thing, you know, you'd uh, far, far more than I thought, actually, at the time. Um, they did really look after us. Um, and I, I've seen it online where people, you know, slag it all off and, you know, what have you, but... When you go out and do a job like that, you're not going to get hugs every two minutes. Don't get me wrong, but um, we were really looked after. You know, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you that you know, um, far better than the future. <laughs> well, I, I, I'll put some context around it. Yeah, I know one five six like the back of my hand. Frank Cannon was yeah. there. Um, yeah. Sam Appleyard, yeah. Bob Grant, John Grant. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. My dad was a military policeman. Yeah. 
and yeah. he was at 19 Brigade, which was in Cherry Tree Camp. And yeah. then when 19 Brigade went, this is in the late 60s, oh. they all went into uh, Gujarat, and my dad yeah. then joined the Sydney Police. But when I was on major investigations, when the lads were killed, I raised around three thousand pounds for the memorial that now sits in the still, yeah, yeah, still there. there. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, we used to have dinner dances, and all the money we raised went to that. So I've got a massive affiliation with the Royal Military Police. Well, Paul Long, um, who, you, who you probably know, or um, well, I've heard of, I've yeah. Heard of. Um, Paul was uh, a lance corporal, actually a very new lance corporal in my um, my section. Right. Um, he was our he was our desk boy. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, he was our um, a tragic, tragic, lovely bloke, really, yeah. really lovely bloke. Um, yeah, absolutely tragic what happened. You know. Um, yeah. 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 Absolutely. But yeah, I, I I keep in touch with quite a few of them from there. Yeah. Uh, because you, you know, I don't see them physically, but uh, no. it's. It is what it is. Pete Lavery, I think, was probably there at that time as well. But, yeah, it's it's a small world. So when you are deployed overseas, you're in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. It's a tough gig. Are you in married quarters in Northern Ireland? Or Yeah, I was. Um, I was up near uh, Bally Kennedy um, base. Um, I, can't remember. Um, I was at Clooney base, which was in um, Londonderry, but I, was right. to, I, was, I lived up the road. Um yeah, I was in uh, Married Quarters then, sorry. And, yeah. there, and there wasn't any um, significant action, although there was still action no, taking it place. Wasn't like it wasn't like it is. I mean, I left in 2000, so, you know, the guys and girls that went through, you know, Afghanistan, Gulf and all that, you know, that was well before my time. I mean, if everyone, anyone, I remember <laughs> I remember going back, actually, yeah, when I was at uh, Fullfield Ambulance and all the shop, um, a few of our guys, literally a handful, got deployed to uh, Bosnia. Um, right, yeah, and um, and it was under the UN then, you know, completely different. Um, and they got, um, as I understand it, I think the, the I think it might be the Royal Welsh Fusiliers or something like that, probably, um, got surrounded basically by loads of Serbs, and you know, I think they put they, they shot them up for months, and yeah. then guys come back, and they've been the only people that've been in proper action for ever, and they were like, everyone's like, wow, my god, that's amazing, yeah. Um, yeah, it wasn't really even a thing in my days, the 90s. You know, yeah, we got pot shots here and there, but you know, it wasn't like it is with the people who went to Afghanistan and oh, Iraq, no. nowhere near. It really and wasn't a thing, you know. You, you only have to look at the medal sets that the you know, the soldiers have, you know, from 2000 absolutely. onwards, they're yeah. absolutely, you know, oh, no, they're, they're chest, you know. yeah, they are <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, a chest are absolutely full of of medals. I don't think we'll ever see that again. Hopefully no. not. But okay. it's um... no hats off to them. I mean, you know, I left before then. Um, yeah. So, did you get yeah. Did you get deployed overseas? Did you go uh, to theatre? I, um, I went obviously in Northern Ireland, but um, uh, yeah, they kept sending me back to Cyprus for some reason. I don't, oh. I don't know. They must think I need just suntan. Um, I went there four times in all: uh, one UN and and three. Um, British Forces Cyprus. Um, so yeah, that was yeah, that was me really. Um, in Colchester, there used to be a, a military hospital. Yes, they did. Yeah. Which is gone now. There's a med centre there yeah. now, which is right near the barracks. The the, oh. the the main, I call it the new barracks, where two and three power are, are based. Yeah. And then you've got Gujarat, which is just you know they call it Monkey Island locally, but um, it, because it is an island right in the middle now, there's roads on either side of it. So, yeah, I finished a few years ago. It's a really weird place now. It's um, it's very much sort of completely gone. What I remember, it's like you know, you've got the new Paris, yeah. which was when I was there, it was Tenbridge, I think, um, RLC. Yeah, like, over at Roman Way. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, and and the rest of it was round where Gujarat is now. It was all sort of round that, really. Yeah. Um, but that's all gone. You know, it's it's, it's weird. Yeah. Hyderabad, Kirky, McMahon. Yeah, yeah. All, all, all of those. Yeah, Ten Ridge were, were up at uh, Roman Way Barracks. Yeah. I was up there recently. I did a podcast uh, with a guy there who deals, deals with mental health. He does the Medicine Ball Challenge. I'll put his link in the, uh, in the footage of this podcast. And I went into Roman Way Barracks, and that's changed out of all proportion. I, mean, I used to play hockey against the Army, mm. and we used to go there for beers afterwards, which was very nice. And because it was a very, it was it was a Gurkha 
you know, very Gurkha-led Tenridge, certainly, you know, with the um, Royal Corps of Transport, as it was then. But, yeah, yeah. He's, uh, Colchester's got happy days for, for me. And, you've got, of course, you've got the military prison uh, just across the way at um, Beer Church Hall Road. Yeah. Well, they, uh, funny enough, I know, in the RMP, I, I very rarely went there. I went there probably twice in my service. Right. But, in, um, you know, just to drop people off, or I, I think I took a statement there once. <laughs> you know, but, um, right. Someone had a kick in or something, you know. Um, but I got, I got called back there in 2011. They sort of um, asked me if I'd come back to the military, funny enough. Um, oh, really? From the police. So, um, yeah, so I went and worked in that prison, or West well, Prison, really. So. Basic training, basically. Yeah, <laughs> but, it is. Yeah. Um, yeah, very interesting sitting on the other side. Very interesting. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I went back there for a little bit of time. So, so yeah, that was an interesting time. You know, so, yeah, yeah I've, I've been back in there a few times, but uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting place. Mm. So you sign off from the military. Yeah. What police service did you join and why? Um, I joined Hertfordshire. Um, right. I'd know where to live, really. I, mean, I, didn't, I don't have any roots anywhere, really. Um, so, I, funny enough, from Colchester, I was obviously looking at Essex, please. Um, yes. I liked, I liked Essex. I mean, Colchester was a lovely area. I quite yeah. liked it. Really liked the Essex area. Um, I would have joined that, but they weren't recruiting. So, right. yeah. I'm not qualified for anything else. <laughs> so, what am I going to do? Um, so I just really just put the, you know, I didn't really want to go into London, to be fair, at the time. Um, although I spent most of my career there, stupidly, but, um, part of the time that wasn't a thing. I just wanted to be outside and do, you know, so I looked around and there was Bedfordshire and Cambridgeshire and Hertfordshire. And, yeah, I happened to get into Hertfordshire and, um, yeah, they were, to be fair, great force at the time. Where did you get posted to? I started off at, um, at the time, I was in North Hertfordshire, so it was like um, Letchworth, Hitchin, yeah. uh, Royston Bulldog. They sort of co covered that area across the top there of North Hertfordshire. Um, and I did my training. Um, I went to Brighton. Um, so, and I love that. I mean, that was just amazing. I, I really had a great time in Brighton. Great bunch of people. Um, so I did my training there for, I think it was like 15 weeks or so. Um, and then went back. We we had all that to go to Letchworth at the time from my area anyway, um, to do our sort of uh, what is now probation and training sort of unit. Um, and I think we spent about ten weeks there, I guess, something like that. Um, and then I got posted to Hitchin. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, so that's where I was based. I did, you know, basically I started off <laughs> patrolling the town centre. Um, yeah, and so went from there, really. So, yeah. That's... And what sort of stuff would you deal with in Hitchin? And, and you know, what sort of stuff had you been in, engaged in compared to your Royal Military Police stuff? Um, to be fair, um, they treated me a bit like an adult because I, they knew what I did before, I think. Um, without saying, I think, you know, they look you up. When, I, mean, I, was, yeah. I was 26, I guess, by then, which at the time was a bit later than a lot of recruits. I mean, now that's it's not unusual for even people sort of our age to, to join the police. Back then, yeah, yeah. people didn't join the police very late. Um, so um, I got pretty much left alone. But I had a fantastic sergeant who was a, a very much yesteryear sergeant, um, Sergeant Berry, his name was. And, um, yeah, he, he taught me a lot. Um, as in, it was very much rules. You know, you will – it was discipline, but in a good way. Um, yeah. Which I think, and I, I know, sounds makes me sound really out, you know, out. Of I know what you're going to say. It was a, a very much sign of its times. I, whatever the public are doing, you know, the boys, and I say boys and girls, I'm not in that derogatory way at all. But the boys had your hair cut short. You didn't wear earrings. You know, you won't have visible tattoos. You had to be clean shaven. You know, you couldn't turn up to work drunk. All that sort of stuff. You know, they, that was there. You know, they were rules. So you turned up any of them bang you know and the girls were the same i mean the girls had to have very little makeup on um you know hair in a bun it was all them sort of things and that was just the way it was and the discipline wasn't discipline like you had in the military don't get me wrong but they were standards and, and they're, they're absolutely right and so there should be uh, well i mean i was you know when i was leaving people had 16 pierces and a mohican and i'm not joking that's i know yeah you know um <sighs> You know, we can all sit here and slag that off, 
and people will, I'm sure. You know, but that's you can't. There's standards because I mean, if I walked in today, I walked in. To say, you know, if you need a lawyer or a doctor, and you walked in and they looked like that, would you stay there? Would you have confidence in? Them? I don't know. Um, personally, no. You know, that's me. I, I, I agree. I, at, I agree. I, I walk into a doctor, I expect someone sitting there neat, you know, calm, looking the part, you know. And uh, it, yeah, it does sound very yes to you, and I appreciate that, but that's just the way it is, you know, the way I feel. Um, no, I, I, listen, you won't find an argument because I absolutely agree. I just, the, the problem we have, and, and I think, you know, I, I believe in the thin blue line. I think it's absolutely, you know, the, the, the fact that it isn't political. You know, the, the badge of the thin blue line is not political. It is about remembering those people that have fallen. But mm -hmm. let me get that blue lamp out. When I joined, you weren't allowed to wear anything other than a poppy yep. for a period of time. When poppies went on sale until the Remembrance Parade, that's yep. all you would wear. Now, some people are adorned like Christmas trees. Absolutely, yeah. And, and from that... Bear in mind that a police officer works without fear or favour. Mm -hmm. From the badges and everything else that they wear, you can see where their affiliations lie. Now, that could be that they're wearing, you know, the thin blue line isn't what you wear on the outside, it's what you wear on the inside for me. It's, you, if your heart believes in the police service, you'll feel that pain every time a copper gets killed. Absolutely. You, that goes without saying, you know, your uniform should reflect that anyway. But if you're wearing a CND, a pro-Palestine, even if you're wearing a pride badge, you know, and I've got lots of gay friends, that just becomes, it's become a political piece. The whole thing, you know, the wristbands and everything else, it becomes a political piece. And the police are a non-political organisation. So I think that... Whilst I'm not a massive fan of Mark Rowley or the, the hierarchy within the Metropolitan Police, I think he's actually right on this occasion because it, it gets it back. But everybody has to abide by the rules. I think it comes down to what a uniform is. A uniform is uniform. Yes. You know, it, is, you know, it's, yeah. it is what it is. You know. um, yeah, I mean, I've, I, you know, I'm, I'm out of it now, but you know, um, I see standards just in general have gone lower um, um, over time, you know, big time now. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. No, <laughs> I, I agree with you, Matt. So you've, you're in Hertfordshire. How long, yeah. were, how long were you there? I was there three years to start with, and then I threw my teddy in a corner one day. Um, I was going for a divorce. Um, I didn't really want to be at work, so I just walked out. Um, Did you? <laughs> yeah. I walked oh my into my life. sergeant, bless him. He was a really nice sergeant as well. And I just went, you know what? I'm out the door. And he said, you can't do that. You've got to put your resignation in. Got to... I went, nah, it's more a card. Lock us there. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Why? So like, what was it? Was... I just didn't want to be in the police. Uh, it wasn't the police. It was me. It was very much I just needed my space. And, um, yeah, I just oh, I threw my teddy in the corner, basically. Um, it wasn't anything that happened. I think it was just a... I build up things, you know, going through a divorce, and I was losing everything at the time. I, you know, losing the house and the kid. Uh, I had a boy um, who uh, was, you know, um, I split up probably uh, not that actually. I was only about a year in Hertfordshire before I split up, really. Um, and she moved up north, took my son with her, um, and it was all the combination of a lot of stuff going on. I was in a place hostel because I couldn't live in the house because I didn't have any furniture. Oh, <laughs> so it's all pretty crap, really. Got left in a mountain of debt, which I didn't even know existed. Um, and I'm not going to blame her. We'd been through some awful times. I mean, we'd lost children, and it, it had been a bad time before that. So um, as in we lost children, they died. As in yeah, lost, yeah, yeah. Um, and, um, yeah, she moved up the North Poles going for a... A shit time really um but yeah i just walked out one day i thought yeah done with beer so i just left um and i spent probably about two nearly three months going up mountains went to north of france walked around north of france um can't speak french that was an interesting time um yeah it was just um i was a foot passenger getting to calais as a foot passenger was a bit interesting because <laughs> that place ain't nice um, <laughs> Um, yeah, just 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 
yeah, and then run out of money, basically. <laughs> so you, you actually signed out of the police. You just walked out yeah. the door, no, 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 no. handed everything back and said, do you know what, I'm not doing this anymore, and yeah. they stopped paying you. They stopped paying me, yeah, yeah. I walked out, I was unemployed. So um, I walked out, I had nothing. I, just, I didn't even have a job. I had nothing. I'd saved a bit of money, so I was all right um, for a couple of months, two or three months. Um, so I was okay. Yeah, I went out and I literally just climbed mountains. Um, you know, I, I like to do that, although I've done one recently, it killed me. Um, <laughs> so I realised it's twice as high as it was before, and I'm <laughs> twice the age. <laughs> so, oh, um, no. But um, yeah, so I just walked out. I just, yeah, I had nothing. I literally went nothing. Um, and then ran out of money. So I, I grovelled my way back, basically. Yeah. So you come back to the UK. Yep. You've got nowhere to live. I had my house still because I'd have always, I always managed to keep the house. Um, right. I had nothing in my house. <laughs> I had a mattress, I think, and a torch. <laughs> there was nothing in my house. I had a couple of bags that I brought back with me. Um, but um, yeah, I didn't have a lot. So, um, what did you do next then? Well, I came back to Hertfordshire. I was driving past it because um, Hertfordshire police um, are just off the A1 in, uh, in uh, Hertfordshire. It's the A1M for most of yeah. um, And so I was going, I was literally driving past it in my little old battered up course that I had at the time. <laughs> um, and I saw the sign um, for where they were, where the girls sitting. And I thought, Do you know what, I need a job. I've got, I need to go. So I went back and I, I sort of literally pulled into their front door, if you like, went to the reception and said to the receptionist, so look, you know, I'm, I'm ex PC Baker. Um, I want to rejoin. I thought it was that simple. You know, she, she laughed at me. She went, don't really work like that. You know? <laughs> so um, so uh, she said to me, she said, um, I'll get someone from um, recruitment to come down and speak to you. So I said, okay. So this fellow come down and said, hello, <laughs> I'll give him all my details. And um, <laughs> he can't believe this. Can't no. make up. <laughs> um, so um, this fellow come down, took me details, and he went, you know, who's your sergeant, who's your inspector, et cetera, et cetera. And... Um, where do you work and all that sort of jazz? And um, he said, look, I'm not being funny, mate. He's saying it really work. But I'll go upstairs to make some inquiries. I'll come back down. So he went upstairs, done that. Come down. He said, you start next Monday or whatever it was, you know. No um, way. Same, same team. Yeah. And this is the time. I mean, not being funny. The police are calling out for officers now. They weren't back then. Um, it was very hard to get in the police back in the day, as you probably know yourself. It was <laughs> hard. Um, yeah, so I went back literally where I started. Um, went back on the you know same place. The oh only thing no! Just they wouldn't give my number back. Uh, so I was seven eight two when I went there, and they gave me six three six. Wouldn't give me seven eight two back. But funny enough, I then uh, became a tutor, um, and I tutored the person that had seven eight two. Well, I know. <laughs> so, what what did the sergeant say? So you've gone back in. Hello, sergeant. Remember me? I bet they went grey. They were a little bit like they were. But to be fair, they were really pleased to have me back. So it wasn't like it was. Um, it was almost like having a holiday. But I just did one. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, went for that. Um, but I didn't stay there very long. And in, in, in doing that was response policing. Um, um, I got sort of poached to go and do a, um, a town team. Um, right. So I was pretty much mainly playing clothes, working around the town. Um, which yeah, I really loved that. I mean, that was a great job. Um, really, really enjoyed that. Um, worked with some fantastic people on there. Um, it was that was hard work. I mean, it's proper thief cake taking, legging it down the roads off people, you know, that sort of stuff. Now I love that, you know. I didn't want to go there to start with, funny enough. Um, I got sort of uh, sort of coerced into doing it. <laughs> I wasn't dumped into doing it, I agreed to do it, but um, it probably one of my best jobs ever, to be fair, you know, loved it. Yeah, and two people on that as well. So that was great times. Yeah, loved it. Did you get involved in any major crime? Um, f- uh, funny enough. <laughs> so back in the day, we're, we're talking now. I mean, this is obviously twenty plus years, or twenty years ago or so. You know, something like. That. Um, didn't really get made. You know, we had stabbings and you know, rapes and all that sort of stuff going with. So I got involved in that side of it, but as a uniform bobby, basically. Um, so it wasn't like I was involved in the investigation. I certainly no. wasn't. That was well above my my pay grade. Um, I did my inspector at the time. Um, he basically got me up there on a promise of giving me like, extra courses. You know, so he was going to give me where do you want to go in five years' time? I'll get you up there. Come work for me. I'll do this. Nothing come from that. Right. Apart from one day, 
he phoned me and I was on my way to work. I was, <laughs> I was in blues, half blues. So I'm driving to work and he phones me up. And he goes, Baker, because that's what he used to talk to me. Baker, where are you? I said, well, God, I'm driving to work. He said, well, don't come here. Don't come here. Drive to this hotel near Wellington City. I was like, okay, why? And he went, you'll find out when you get there and hung up on me. I was like, you know, what, what am I doing? You have no idea. So I turned up at this, this hotel. It's not there anymore. I turned up at this hotel, went to reception, went, hello, I have no idea why I'm here, but this is me. And she went, that's fine. They're expecting you in that conference room there. I went, okay. So I walked in this conference room. Now you can imagine, I'm in half blues. So for them, if you don't know, that's boots, trousers, white, white shirt. I think it was, was it blue? No, I think it was probably white by that time. Yeah. Um, and a jacket. And I'm walking to this conference room and there must be 30 people sitting in there. And they're all in a big semicircle with one chair in the middle, which, you know, is my chair, obviously. And there's a bloke stand, sitting at the front who's watching them. Old grizzle, old veteran. And I walk in and I'm like, geez, you know, I'm, I'm probably not even 30 years old at the time. And all these are grizzled veterans, all of them, male and female. Mainly yeah. male, but there's a couple of ladies in there. And I said, hello, I'm in the right room. Yeah, yeah, they're all in cities. I'm the only person that's wearing any semblance of any uniform. And he said, hello, yeah, you're me. Yeah, can sit over there. Oh, thank you. Great. So I sat down. I thought, I don't even know why you're there. And it starts. So he says, you haven't missed much. He said, they're just introducing themselves. I said, OK, cool. So there's a couple of up from me. He says, hello, hello. I'm John, he says, uh, or something similar, you know. Um, I'm from Crops, which for yeah. those who don't know, is a um, reconnaissance uh, surveillance team for Brawl. Yeah. And, um, and I've been in 27 years. I've been in four, three, four years by now, you know. And, um, and then it carries on. And it's getting nearer to me. There's people in there from Customs, MI5, Headquarters, Major Crime. You name it. And I'm, I'm I'm a PC on the beat. You know, I'm like, what the freaking am I doing here? You know what I mean? I, it comes to me, I said, <laughs> oh, Mick, I've been here for years or whatever it was. I've done three, four years. Um, I have no idea why I'm here. You know, and it turns out that was um, the surveillance lockkeeper and disclosure officer course. Oh, wow. Which was a course at the time. I have no idea why I was even there. And it was a fantastic course. It was a really good course. But that led on to a lot of other courses after that. Because as you know yourself, um, the way the police works, you get courses, you get courses, if that makes sense. You know, you do yeah. one, you get loads. Um, yeah, yeah. So I did a load of stuff around surveillance. I did a, um, a test purchases course. I never even wanted to go on that, wasn't interested, but ended up on that, um, did surveillance stuff. Um, not full-time, never done any of these jobs full-time. Did you um, get deployed on the TP stuff? No, uh, once, but I didn't feel comfortable doing it, to be fair. And I had to meet a fella in a pub. That was literally it, um, and it was one of the t- other TPs that I was, you know, um, uh, that was obviously doing his job, and I was, you know, I mean, not being funny. Look at me; I don't look like I can blend in. I'm a cop. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe yeah. that's maybe that's what the modern police service want. They want people to blend in so they don't get involved. But well, you know, I I was what I was, and I did that. I didn't feel comfortable doing, it, not because I didn't enjoy it. Because it is a really good job. Them people are brave as hell. I mean, oh, that. they are. Yeah, they are. Shadow of a doubt. Um, it just wasn't what I was into at the time. I was a thief taker. I was a, you know, I wanted to run up and down roads chasing people. And, you know, you speak to anyone knows me back then. I love nicking people at the time. I mean, yeah. you know, the glaze come off eventually, but at the time it was just, you know. But there is something about, I, I, I was a, a, a UC manager, there's something about someone walking into an office saying, I bought this boss, you know, and they they walk in with a load of heroin or coke yeah. or guns. I mean, it's... it's yeah. sort of... no, it's big as stuff. I mean, you know, I'm drinking... Uh, Nick and shop with the 20 quid out of W.H. Smith saying, can we change the world? Do you know what I mean? But they're the same... <laughs> but often they're the same people. They're the same people that are, you know, the the criminality... They're entrepreneurs, a lot of them. They'll, they don't stick to one line of criminal activity they will get involved in many so so how long were you in Hertfordshire before you moved on I did five years there um right to the end um which I felt really guilty leaving because they gave me a job back and then two years later I walked out the door again. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know um yeah um, where, did, where did you go from there though? um Hertfordshire were good folks at the time so um, why so did you leave though well because I was on the town team um I was I 
I ended up uh, planning a load of operations, really. For, it was mainly anti sort of um, theft from town, obviously. Yeah. That's what people do. Um, so it's a load of operations, and I sort of got into. We've done a lot of um, intelligence work, if you like, and realised that obviously a lot of these people were moving between towns by trains. Yeah. Um, and so our shoplifters were coming in. They weren't local. Well, some were, obviously. Um, but most of them were coming in from places like Stevenage or in from Bedfordshire or wherever. Yeah. And so I decided to send, do a, a basically a, um, an operation at Hitchin Railway Station. And at the time, Hitchin was covered by BTP from um, British Transport Police from Peterborough, um, which was run by a sergeant. And um, so I got in contact with him. He said, yeah, I'll spy a few people. I'll come down myself. I'll do this, I'll do that. And it was a really successful operation. We ended up with loads of nicks. We ended up with, um, we got the warrants um, people up from the courts um, for the non-payment fine stuff. We had revenue there doing you know, the ticket jobs and what have you. And it turned out to be a really successful operation. And we ended up doing that quite regularly to such an extent that it sort of kiboshed theft in town really right. to a massive extent. I mean, I went down from, I think on their own figures at the time, it went down like a sixth of what it had been before, you know, by doing all these different things we were doing. So it was really, really successful. Um, and I remember the town team sort of person from um, Stevenage, which is a far bigger town. He was like, he, I remember going to a meeting one day. He's like, can I have work? I was like, yeah. He said, what are you doing? I said, what? He said, what are you doing at Hitchin? Because all your people are now coming and doing it on my patch because they're not doing it all around, <laughs> you know, because we were absolutely on them. Um, so it was really successful. But anyway, while that's going on, the sergeant there, um, I, won't, I won't name him, um, but it was a really nice guy. Um, I think he's now firearms inspector, I think, and maybe a chief inspector, really guy, nice guy. He's like, Nick, um, so at the time, you think of the time, this is now 2005, um, the bombings hadn't quite happened, but they weren't far off. Um, yeah. The four I went to were a bit of a tin pot force at the time. Um, weren't very well regarded, very badly funded, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but he's like, Mick, they're trying to, you know, they want some professionals in. They've basically been told that they need to look after their own crime, sort themselves out, otherwise they're going to close them down and, you know, they won't exist anymore. So they're, they're basically poaching people from outside. And they're looking at, because um, I was a tutor, they, they set up a tutor unit, um, a centralised tutor unit in London, um, and you'd be ideal for it. So I thought, mm, you know, why not? Yeah. So, yeah, I ended up um, going to London. Yeah. and uh, Working at tutor. Camden? Sorry? You worked at Camden? Yeah, well, I started off at King's Cross because um, right. I went on response for a bit because they hadn't opened. Um, they were still using, um, on the north, well, I was on London North, as they called it back then, um, a response, absolutely fantastic time, a big eye opener though, like really exposed me to a lot of stuff that I wasn't really ready for, to be fair. Such um, as, sorry, such as fatalities were massive, um, and I was not prepared for fatalities. I really wasn't. I, I've been in the army. I had seen fatalities. I've been, de I dealt with a lot of stuff in my time, but it's very, very regular. Um, as in, you know, in Hopshire, I've probably done it. <laughs> half a dozen, not even that, probably less than a hand full of people I dealt with. But then I expected to pick people up, you know, um, that are fatal. And when I, I don't want to get too graphic, I, I don't want to make it surrendous, but an inside out person, you're picking them up. Um, and I wasn't really ready for that. And that was normal. It was it was just like, we're going to do this. And it was like, oh. And where the team I went on to, I was actually, even though I was only five years in, I was a response driver. Um, I was five years in. I was an experienced person. I yeah. was, you know, it was full of probationers. There was only, my sergeant was amazing, great sergeant. Um, we had an inspector. We had, you know, my team were amazing people. Um, but it was like, that's what we did, you know. And, you know. and these are people who have taken their own lives, aren't they, that, you, that you're dealing with? So there's, there's not only is there the backdrop of what they've done, but you've also got in the background a, a grieving family who've got a lot of unanswered questions, which you also have to deal with. And you also have 100,000 people that are trying to get from King's Cross to wherever mm -hmm. who are, are grumpy. Not that you get to see that, but 
you're conscious of the fact that you've got a person who's on a track who needs picking up before the trains can come through because obviously that's pound notes as well. So there's a there's a culmination of things there that apply a significant amount of pressure. Yeah, I mean it was a it was a shocker for me. I joined in um, October of two thousand and five, um, so it was after the bombings. So we had right. the bombings in London. So it was after that. Um, and I remember going out to jobs, and we were that they had a um, and probably still have a target for a suicide. So if you can confirm it's a suicide, um, ninety minutes from the minute it comes in to the minute it clears, it's got to be ninety minutes. Wow! Good. Which coming from Hertfordshire, where you could be sat on a cordon for all day, all night, you know. It's, yeah. Um, that's not a thing. You know, you've got 90 minutes. Now, bear in mind, it can take you half an hour or an hour to get there, you know, if you're depending on where it is. Um, and then you know. you've got to walk the line. Yep. Um, and then you've got to get on there, get a body bag, chuck it all in, make sure you've got the right bits and um, take it off and then hand it back. And that's 90 minutes. And that, that to me, was a bit... I got into a place that it was normal, but I look back and it ain't normal. No, it's not normal. Um, because, um, I mean, I'll probably cover this in a bit, but, um, yeah, it, it, you know, I remember on near Christmas that year, it must have been a couple of days before Christmas, because, I mean, suicides at Christmas are obviously you're probably aware, you know, a bit yeah. bigger than the rest of the year, you know, all yeah. the time, unfortunately. Um, I remember coming back to the office and they said, well, we don't know who this person is. Um, we need you to go to the mortuary with someone else. Um, another person who I won't name again, but he's now a sergeant, um, fantastic guy. Um, but um, going to a mortuary in North London and having to get the body out and fingerprint, dead set, as they called it, dead set hand. And it's literally in my hand. They wash it off for me in the mortuary, but I've got a hand, literally a severed hand or arm in my hand, broken bones, because it's all broken because it's been yeah. under a truck. Um, and I'm dead set in it. You know, which you know, doing <laughs> you that. Know. But that's not that's not normal. I mean, look. But it's not normal. But it's I, not, I'm I, laughing now. But yeah, it's, it's not a normal thing in life. You know. But you normal you do normalise it in your own mind. I mean, I, I I don't I don't harp back to anything that I dealt with mentally. Yeah, I talk about it because you know I remember everything, every post mortem I've ever been to, every death I've been to. Um, you know, the first jumper I saw, things like that. I, I vividly remember that. It doesn't have an impact on me as a individual, but I understand why it does impact on people because it's it's not normal. Maybe I'm not, maybe I'm me, not normal. So, I mean, uh, it didn't. Uh, funny enough, um, it, well, I can't remember the majority of things I've been to. I really can't. Right. Um, and I'll tell you for why. So when I was going back, go back, we rewind. Um, I'm in Cyprus, very young. I was 19 at the time, I guess. Cyprus, the southern base areas, uh, British areas in Cyprus, um, but they're military. Uh, the um, military uh, run the, the, the British area, if you like. So the emergency services are the medical corps do the ambulances, defence yeah. fire services do the fire brigade, the southern base area do the uh, southern base area police do the policing. So I was brought over there as a bit of a um, a stopgap because they had a, a many could come off a bike and had to come back to the UK. And so, like, oh, you're off to Cyprus. I was like, yeah, he's great. You know, I'm young and it's great, Cyprus, you know, who you knows? You know. um, very young medic, not really had any real practical experience. Very well trained, don't get me wrong, but yeah. practical experience, zip all really. Um, in the medical centre, um, and you run, you're on an ambulance, and the ambulance is you and a civilian driver. But this is a normal emergency ambulance like you see now yeah. obviously back in the day uh you can call a medic out you can do a doctor out whatever but you're it so i went out to this um yeah i was literally my second or third day um i get called out at night time to a head-on rtc yeah um two families basically head on on the top base area i get there defense fire service there some base area police there doing the best they can but they look at you as the expert i'm 18 yeah. oh, sorry 19 years old I'm a kid. I look back now, my son's older now, I still look at him as a kid, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I just think, I get there and everyone's help and I'm just getting everything. I've done the best I could, you know, dead, dying. It was horrendous. You know, you've never seen nothing like it. It was like, 
horrendous for me at that age. And I come out there and I finished. And um, yeah, the, the reinforcements arrived eventually, but I was probably there 20 minutes doing my own, doing the best I could. I felt I did really badly, but apparently I did very well, if that makes sense. Um, I come around, beat myself up for the next, I was off the next day. And then I went back in the day after and the doctor that I was assigned to was like, I need a word. I said, okay, sir, so I'm in the office. He went, what's going on? I said, I can't cope with this. I can't do this anymore. <coughs> Done. You know, I need to transfer out. I need to do another job. And he said, what's the problem? I said, I just can't cope with what happened yesterday or the day before. I can't cope with it. That's too much for me. And he said, your problem is you're too emotional. I'm too emotionally attached. Okay. I went, okay. Now he's giving me the best bit of advice that actually sorted me out from my life, but then screwed me up at the end. If that makes sense. So I'll explain. Yeah. So he said to me, if you need to be in trauma and medical, anything medical and trauma related, you need to take the emotion out of it. And the only way you can do that is look at a human body like a mechanic looks at a car. Okay. Don't look at the emotions. Just look at how we can help that, whole, that human body. If that makes sense. Yeah. And I remember walking out of there thinking, what a prick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What's he know? Yeah. And then I thought about it and I processed it and, and then I did. And I completely dumped the emotions for the whole of my career. In everything I've done since 19 years of age, I dumped it. Completely dumped everything. Um, which was good at the time. And it helped me out through when I was picking up dead people and everything I've done before and since. It helped me out until it didn't help me out. So what so, changed though? I mean, it, it, it's funny because I, I I believe that some forms of PTSD, there was trauma in somebody. I'm not a counsellor, mate, by any stretch of imagination. I'm certainly not an expert in this. But I wonder if there was a trauma in people's lives before they got to the point of having PTSD. If there was something like a, a, a road collision where – Dead and die. Listen, I was a murder squad detective. I'd turn up; they were they were already dead. Yeah, I did. I didn't have to try and help people, and then all of a sudden that. And I've got a a, a guy I worked with who who witnessed a, a vehicle hitting a a bridge and catching on fire, and he tried to save the four kids inside, and they all died in front of him. That was, and that that trauma will be with him for the rest of his life. And I wonder if that's something that sparks off PTSD in later life when something else just builds up in the, in the bottle of crap, basically. I think, you know, having gone through the process of all that, you know, um, which you may or may not be aware, um, I've been through all that counselling sort of stuff. Um, it's not one thing with me. It was never one thing that, you know, like some person can get a, a one instant and say, yeah. that's what I've done it. It wasn't that. It was hundreds Absolutely, hundred. I mean, you, you know, um, as I said, five years in Hertfordshire, I saw probably three dead bodies. You know, yeah. meeting. I've done that in a day. Sorry, I shouldn't mention that. Oh, pardon me. The police force I worked with, he, edit that one out, okay? Um, but the police force I worked with, um, I could do that in a day. You know that. You know that's. You can you can say BTP. You've left now. It's not. A, it's not a. It's not a well, secret. Well, okay british transport police that's the false um but that was normal that wasn't abnormal if you went to a day it was not normal, uh, not abnormal so so look you 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 you've gone on your journey with your new force and every day there's a there's a fatality and you're on a busy line and it's a, a horrendous setup but what support did you get within that organization in order to deal with your personal needs your mental well-being, what did they give you? Um, so if you imagine finishing, I mean, I, I worked on specialist units quite a lot um, within them. Um, but even then, um, it was flagged up that it needs to be um, something there, but it just never happened. Um, they, and there's guys and girls out there now, literally as we're speaking, are probably dealing with this. Um, and they will get end of... Um, so when I, I left, I didn't leave long ago. So it's not yesteryear. This is this year. Yeah. Um, my last sort of active shift, if you like, was July this year. Yeah. Um, what we now it's October. October. So we're not yeah. long ago. Um, there, you would finish the job. Your 
it used to be when I was when I was up in London, yes, you'll get an inspector turn up. Now, invariably, if you're outside of London, you're talking a sergeant. Yeah. Um, they get it together. Now, bear in mind, you not only you pick the body up, at least two of you are going to the mortuary. Okay, now the mortuary, the undertakers turn up, they take the body off you, they put it in the van and off they go and you follow them. Sounds nice. All done. Apart from when you get to the mortuary, you've now got to tag them. Yeah. So you've got to open that body bag, um, find a wrist or a foot, or both if you could, um, and then tag them. Okay, so that's not a nice thing to do. No. Okay, you might have to ph uh, photograph it if you don't know who they are. Um, I don't get too graphic, but there was. Well, a couple but we of are talking about yeah. a bag of mush, aren't we? We're not talking about yeah. no, you're not talking that you can mush. identify it. You know, you can't walk in and say, "Oh, this is Granny Smith," and and you know the family no. will be able to see because that's the other thing. The mm. families can't go and see these bodies. Absolutely not. No, I mean. You, I mean, I'm not saying every fatality is like that. It's not, but um, but a fair few. I mean, talking on fast trains, if you like big trains, you're certainly talking. You know, some could spread over two, three, four hundred meters. You know, you're not oh yeah, about absolutely. <laughs> um, so put them in a bag, and then you're expected to get in that bag and try and find a foot um, or a hand. You know, I mean, you know, that's again normalised, but isn't normal. Um, and you know, I mean, I I personally didn't, and and again, people who've been watching this who know me, I was absolutely crap at doing death messages to go and go around and see the family and saying, oh, yeah. I was crap at it because I had no emotion, so I couldn't at the time. I mean, this isn't this is not me now. Back in the day, I would have walked in and said, "Hello, are you John Smith? Yeah, okay, your son's dead. You can't, there's the coroner's details. See you later. I'm walk out the door. I was a leaflet there for you. That's me because I couldn't didn't have the emotion to sit there and tell them, oh, God, that's terrible, you know. And I was terrible at it. So don't send me to that. So, but, and because I was a I was a medic, I was always dealing with dead and dying. But it was very much Mick take someone and go down the mortuary, and I, yeah. I volunteered for it. You know, I did. Um, but I uh, think I, I mean this is this is a terrible thing to say. Uh, but that doctor is right. You know, you do need to. I, I vividly remember delivering death messages. I remember the first one. The first one I ever delivered, a man had been diving in uh, Portsmouth, in the harbour in Portsmouth, and he'd had a massive heart attack. And I had to go and tell his son. I mean, that was that was terrible. Yeah, I'm 21 years old, and I'm knocking on a door in Braintree, telling him. Is you know the the guy that he lived with because his mum and dad had split up and he lived with his dad, he you know his dad was dead and that was terrible. But yeah. the doctor is right; you do need to maintain that distance if you like, simply because you have to maintain a professional, investigative mind around it. Yeah. Because absolutely. the minute you start becoming emotionally involved, you know, with murders, suicides, things like that, you know, suicide where. You don't know how they've died, and it's been treated as suspicious. There yeah. are a lot of things, a lot of hurdles you have to jump through before you can go back to the family and say, "Well, actually, you know, they died of a tramadol overdose." Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, jumping in front of a train is an obvious one. What what isn't obvious is to why they've done it half the time. But when it's a, uh, you know, when someone's taking their own life through uh, taking pills, etc., that's less obvious, and toxicology then bears out. But it is look. It's a difficult job, and not a job that everybody can do. So you should be commended for the fact that you did it for as long as you did without breaking, if you like. Yeah, I. Do you know people say that? You know, um, I didn't see it as that because I actually enjoyed it. I. Weird that say. I don't mean I enjoyed it to death. That's that's stupid. But I'm saying I enjoyed doing my job. I loved my job at the time. I, yeah. I thoroughly enjoyed my job until I realised it was pointless. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I no, I, I understand what you're saying. Sorry, I, I understand what you're saying. I, I, I loved my job, you know, and and it's horrendous. Dealing with death is horrendous, but I found post mortems fascinating. As much as I didn't want to look, I wanted to look, and that and that is how I was, you know. And I suppose I'm I'm weird from that perspective. But what, yeah. at what point did you fall out of love with them? Because I read a LinkedIn post saying that you've, you've written to um, the superintendent, the chief constable, you know, you've written to every, everybody and they've just totally ignored you. What, 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 was, what was that all about? 
Okay, so that lasted three years. Then, so we're talking coming up to the Olympics now. That started, um, we got new bosses at that point. Um, and basically, they had this headset that if you are, sorry, mindset, um, that if you were in plain clothes, you weren't working. So um, everyone was back in uniform, tasking, wasn't really tasking anymore, just turned up in uniform, big yellow jacket, you know, um, which has its place. But as you know yourself, doesn't really sort the problems a lot of the time. Um, criminals ain't stupid. You know? No, of course they're not. They're not dumb. They're not dumb. Um, so that didn't really work. Um, so they come up with a new concept in um, BTP, um, which was a medical unit. They were going to have medics, basically. So train medics out there, advanced medics. Um, get get the system moving. Someone has a problem on the train, the train stops. Ambulance is going to be two hours. Get a medic there, sort it out, get them off, done, move train on. Great, great concept. Just coming just before the Olympics. Um, that then morphed and it's now still unit it goes now. Uh, the network instant response team. Fantastic concept, still works um, to this day in central London. Um, I had a bit of um, a falling out, shall we say, um, at there at some point um, and chose to move where I was going. Um, and then moved to a response post after that. So, yeah. Right. And then I fell out of love with it later on. So, you've got a... You've, you've retired in July of this year. Yeah. But did you take any time off before you left, or...? Yeah. So, last July. So, not July, gone the one before. Yeah. Um, I took time off. I... Had a bit of a breakdown to be fair. Um, didn't realize I was doing it. Um, detriment to my family, absolutely. Um, my children, um, and my friends at work, which I do regard as friends. I mean, my, my team and people at work were amazing, they have and they still are to this day. Still contact most of them. Um, they took me to one side and you know, in turn, just right, Nick, what's going on here? You need to get some help, mate, you know, um, because I wasn't me anymore. Um, so I went to the doctors. I put my little form into the doctors, as you have to email them these days, um, and said, you know, I need some help. They put me in contact with a mental health person, and I went to go and see the doctors. And, you know, as, as I said before, my emotions have been cut off completely. I, yeah. know. Um, I don't cry. It's not me. Um, and then I went to go and see this mental health lady. Absolutely amazing. She sat me down and said, Literally, she knew I was there, obviously. She turned to me and she said, how can I help you? And I literally burst into tears. Literally just like a, you know, absolutely just went, you know, meltdown. And I had about an hour in with her. Um, she referred me to an organisation um, called We Are With You, um, a mental health organisation. And because I was a veteran, luckily, um, I got very, very quick treatment. Um, they signed me off for as long as I needed. Um, yeah, and I went I went through that process. I had um, trauma-based uh, CBT um, that lasted quite a few months. Um, and it was bloody hard work, to be honest. It was... Yeah, of course it is. It, it, is, it is hard work. But you've, but you've got some great allies in the likes of PTSD 999, um, Gary Hayes and, and the great work that he, he does. Yeah. So, you know, you, there are people out there, but... Yeah, what absolutely. was the response from the senior management within the force? <laughs> Did yeah. any of these people have contact with you when you left? No. Um, so um, I went off um, in a bad way. Um, I locked myself away pretty much for a couple of months. Um, didn't want to go out because they're, they're one of the things on the side. So go back sort of five, six years from that, I'd start my own business. Um, so I, I do... Um, medical training essentially right. I train, you know, I've done it for the police, I do it for the outside so um, normal first aid work stuff but also advanced stuff as well yeah. um, also work at ambulances um, and I've done that as a business, self-employed, done it declared it, all there um, so I've been doing it a while um, my, but I, did, I didn't do that because I thought well I can't really do that because I got caught out you know, in, a, in, a, yeah. you know, in greens out in an ambulance looks bad so I locked myself away. I didn't go to the gym, didn't do anything, you know, just literally locked myself away. Um, that went on for a couple of months. Um, I was going in 
I didn't have to, but I went in probably once a month to see my team. And then I give my sick note into my um my, my sergeant. My sergeant was very good. Um I'm not gonna slag him off, he was very good. Um and then one day it was probably about three months in. Um now I hadn't referred myself to um occupational health. Um because they're bloody awful, to be honest with BCP at the time they were terrible. I'd already had deans with them the year before. Um I was having I was response driving and I was having blackout, but like as in I couldn't remember the journey. Right, um, yeah. And I didn't know why. I, I was like literally zoned out. And um, I went to the doctors and said about it, and they said, you know, my blood pressure had gone out through the roof. Um, and a lot of that obviously was to do with what happened later on. Um, so I'd take myself off driving anyway. Um, but occupation health, absolutely useless, did nothing, didn't help. No, no, you know, I went back, I, you know, I went on light duties at that point. Um, and I went back on normal duties because of a phone call. And it was literally, I phoned him up, thought I'm bored, sat in the office. I need to get back out. Um, my phone call was like, hello, yeah, my doctor signed back on. And they hadn't. I mean, I'm, you know, I, I still had the high blood pressure. It wasn't a, a thing. Because I was bored, I said to him, there was no checks and balances there. They went, okay, I'm signed back on then. And I went back to work. <laughs> I, ref- I refused to drive. Not they took me off it, I refused to. Because I thought that's dangerous, and I became a passenger. And to be fair, being so many years as a response driver, I actually quite enjoyed it. To be fair, in being in the passenger seat. Um, so I went back to work anyway. So later on, yeah. So I didn't go to occupational health. I didn't really have much contact with HR. There's no contact really. My sergeant was doing what he did. You know, some of the stuff. Are you all right? That sort of stuff. So that maybe three months in. Um, I went in to do the same thing again into work and Simon said to me, Would you mind staying a little bit longer? And I've been off on six, I never stayed at all. Um, would you stay a bit longer? I said, Okay, um, the inspector wants to come and see you. He wants to check up on you. I said, oh, Okay, no worries. So I stayed there. Now they were meant to be coming in in 10 minutes. An hour later, they turn up, walk in, no apology, no hello, just walked in, checked their emails, done that. You know, it's all pretty crap, to be honest. Um, I'm sitting there thinking, hello? You know, and my, my whole team was in at the time, just sitting there. Sergeant's there as well. And uh, I get called into the office with the sergeant and this inspector. And I thought it was going to be a welfare. I said, how are you doing? You know, that's things. How can I help you? And then basically, I spent half an hour there getting berated, getting told I was lying, that I was, they didn't believe me, that... It was all crap, basically. Uh, I even said at one point, I said, you're doing this now. I said, if I had a broken leg, you know, it's almost like you're twisting my broken leg now. You know, I'm sitting in there and you're, you're hurting me. Um, it was, I got threatened with surveillance because they thought I was working outside the job, which I wasn't. And you can ask anyone that at all. Um, you know, people I work for may see this and they'll, they'll tell you I wasn't, I wasn't there for six months. I just didn't go in. Um, and I was threatened. It was bad. It was really bad. There was no support there at all. Nothing. Um, Did they put any of this in writing to you, though? I mean, all these th- these threats, or was it all done on a verbal basis? Uh, verbal. The sergeant got so embarrassed, he walked out. Um, walked out and went and made a cup of tea. Um, took 10 minutes out. And then I was told, basically, they left the room, the sergeant did, and it was like, I can't tell you this, but I'm going to tell you because it's one-on-one. Um, but this has come from the top, Okay. This is all from the top. It's not me. It's, it's from the top. And I went, okay. Sergeant comes back in the room. Now, everything had been said while that he'd gone. I then repeated in front of the inspector and him. And they had to admit they were, that what I'd said is true. Okay. Um, I walked out of that room. Um, I should have walked out a lot earlier, but I didn't. Um, walked out. My team was still there. I told them what happened. They were disgusted. That inspector then walked out, went home. Um, because they spend a lot of time working from home, which I'm not really sure how that works, but anyway, that's fine. Um, um, I then repeated what happened in front of everyone, in front of the sergeant. He had to admit that it was true. Um, yeah, and uh, I so went home. So what did professional standards say about this bullying then? Nothing. I've emailed. So essentially, nothing really happened then um, at all. Uh, I got uh, Going forward, I had, I had to refer... Because I hadn't referred myself to occupational health to start with, 
And that was a problem, apparently. But I was like, well, I wouldn't refer myself to them because they can't help me any quicker. As a veteran, I got quick, you know, through my doctor, you get it quicker. And therefore, I've gone through the police because the police, I'd still been in a waiting room. My actual counsellor said that. She said, you'd still be in a waiting, waiting list, you know. Um, so um, I said, why would I go through them? But that was a bad thing, so I had to refer myself. HR sent me a letter saying, if you don't come back to work with Sakya, uh, stop you paying Sakya. Um, Occupation Health phoned me up eventually and went, well, there's nothing we can really do because you're getting treatment. So they I think just before I left, um, and I'm not a life safe case. I mean, there's a lot of bad stuff going on at the moment. Um, within, and I don't think it's just there, I think it's police in general. Um, I sent a complaint in, basically, um, while I was still serving. I sent it about, um, so I sent a pre complaint out, basically to where I work, saying, just to let everyone aware this is what's going to go in, roughly. I didn't put the whole shebang there because it was like three pages long. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I sent a, a, a snapshot. Um, and that was a that was about 11 o'clock on a Friday night. Okay, So it was late. I was on, I was on night shift. Nights, uh, late to still in. The panic buttons went. You, you can believe. I mean, salts were running around. My inspector wanted, that particular inspector wanted a Teams meeting with me at midnight, which I refused. Um, I mean, what inspectors at home on a midnight on a Friday wanted to chat to me, unless you're worried, you know? It just, that don't make sense, does it? You know, talking on Monday, you know. Um, but anyway, I refused to speak, um, and I just, I told Sergeant I wouldn't, and they relayed it. Um, I did get a lot of support from that, though. To be fair, people, I had text messages, I had emails, I had points on radio. People in my office like, wow, fantastic. Well done. Well done for speaking out. Because it's not an isolated case. Um, so, yeah. Um, but, but, uh, but so, my, so that my email went in. Um, I'll actually send it to you later, so just so you've got it. Um, yeah, thank so you. I've got no problem showing it. There's no names in there. There's no ranks in there. Um, it's a generalised email, but it's quite big and it's quite in depth. It's all it's all proof. That I, everything I've put in there is completely based on fact, and I can prove that. Um, but I will send it to you later. Thank um, you. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of panic around. Um, I <coughs> then got offered by a superintendent to come up to London and have a chat um, about the issues, which I did. Um, yeah, taking in maybe an hour in there, seemed to take everything very seriously and, you know, feel good, like, you know, the right noises were made. Um, but to this day, nothing's changed. I, I know people there now, are, they're like, nah, nothing's changed. They won't, you know, it was just threats and intimidation. And in the end, I just went, you know what, now, done. So, so you retired yeah. and they let you go off into the sunset? Yeah, no one, no one cared. <laughs> no one cares. I mean, if 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 someone, if Sean O'Callaghan's listening to this, would you sit across the table and speak to him? I mean, do you know him? I, I yeah, I've met him. I, I, you probably the thing was that um, I've I, I've had chief constable's commendations. I've had my Lord Service Medal and all that with the chief. Okay, um, they they probably wouldn't even recognise me. Don't care. I mean, the thing is that. It's all, to me, I'm not that person anymore, okay? I'm not the person that was the, you know, I'm going to do all that to you anymore. I'm not that. I've, I've left and I'm, I've am i realised that it ain't all that. You know, these people think they're very powerful, but I don't think they really are. In, in, in think, yes, would I? Yes, if it would do some help. I don't care about me. That's the, that is the, the bottom line is what's happened to me has happened to me. It's ain't going to change. Nothing's going to change for me now. I've had any help. I've had done this. I've done that. I'm not in a bad place. I, I've got fantastic work now. I mean, literally brilliant. Um, however, there's a lot of people out there, a lot, and it ain't just the force I work with. I speak to other people from other forces, and it ain't just my force that don't have any help. And they need to realise what they're putting through people for every single day. Yeah. Um, you know, and with no back, you know, literally nothing to help anyone. You know, nothing. You, you were going back to when we were talking about fatalities earlier, and th this sounds to anyone listening, 
this sounds really weird. So imagine I'm picking a dead body up with loads of other people. I right? pick it up, chuck it in, in, in there. I go to the wall tree, I tag it, I finish. I go back to the office, okay? We're a few hours later. What do I get? I get, make sure you write your statement, okay? And book your property in. See you tomorrow. And that's, that's it. it. And I'll get an email at some point offering me some help if I want it. Do you, so, so do they, I mean, they can't possibly do PIMS and trim and all that they, because they, they, they would have a dedicated unit that just dealt with the element around the trim stuff. I, so just before I left, this is a, a, a weird point. So I did a peer supporter course. Right. Um, which is fairly new, I think, in policing. Um, and great course. Don't get me wrong, really good, great concept. Now, I had to sign a confidentiality clause there. So anyone I spoke to, if I said anything about what they're coming to me about, I'm sacked. I'm out the door. Right? Yeah. Now, you know yourself, Federation, Federation Union, essentially, if you like, um, and Trim. Neither of them are confidential. Not one of them has signed up to be confidential. They can walk out of there, and they have, because I've seen it, will come out and go, God, I guess what such and such did. You know, oh, God, he's... You know, whatever they can have a chat. So who's going to trust them systems? If I'm talking to you now about this, and you then uh, this is confidential, and you go and put it all over the internet tomorrow, I'll talk to everyone. I know you're going to put this on the internet. But I'm talking, oh, I'm talking yeah. in general. We're talking about this now, and this is confidential. And I, I've got this is confidential, and you then tell everyone. And um, is anyone going to trust you tomorrow? So trim. You know, it's not all that. You know, fair day and all that. Have so, you? Have you done a subject access request? Yes. And what came back from that? I haven't had one yet because they keep bouncing it. They keep wanting well, I mean, more specific, more specific, more specific. It's, 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 uh, you don't need to be but, specific because it's the information about you and about the conversations being held in relation to you. It's your data. You're entitled to it. This isn't a freedom of information request. And I think that some of these data holders seem to yeah. forget that this is your information. If people are saying bad things about you, and I, I should actually do a short video about how to apply for and obtain your data through a subject's access request. You should. You should. Because it's, it's one of the things, I'll put it in, I didn't really know, I just said basically, I want information about me between this day and this day. That's all yep. you me. They bounced it back and fair enough, they said, well, we need a little bit more because, you know, that could be stuff about you doing training or doing, you know, yes. crap. You know, I said, okay, fine. These are the people I want to mention about. Any of these people between this day and this day in relation to this. Um, and that's still, well, I think they bounced it back twice and it's still pending at the moment. So You, you know that you can re make a complaint to the Information Commissioner's Office. Yeah, I think they, they said I've got, I think I've looked at my phone, I think they said it's towards, uh, later on this month, they basically oh, okay. advise, so we'll see. Yeah, I should, I should, because I help so many people with subject access requests. And it's a, a tool that if if organisations realised that they were going to get caught out all the time, yeah. they would behave themselves. They would behave properly. They wouldn't send... Because you're entitled to WhatsApps, text yeah. messages, yeah. emails, any form of messaging, written yeah. notes, audio notes, yeah. anything at all that relates to you. But you have to specify that. Yeah. You can't. It, it can't be a. You know, I just want all this data. It, it's got to be. It's got to yeah. be honed. honed I, I mean, to be fair, all I've asked for at the moment is emails. I don't care about anything else because I know there's been emails sent, and they're the ones I want. I'm not really interested in the rest because, you know, there's. I would be. You know, I, I for instance, right? I sent my. I wouldn't say complaints. My concerns because it wasn't a complaint. It was concerns because it's not about. It's, it wasn't specific to me. The some of it was, but it's very much about behaviours, as in the standards of policing. Yes. If you see policing in offices now, you went back there and sat in the office now, just shut your mouth, sat in a corner and watched it, you'd be horrified. Yeah. You would literally no, be horrified. Um, because I've sat there and, and, and people I know that are serving today, and I'll, uh, you know, I'll speak to a lot, they sit there, you know, I'm not talking people in donkey's years, but people who made 10, 15, 20 years. And the people that come through now, because I think the police load the standards and sergeants are so, at the moment, a lot of them are quite new or temporary um, and they're so crapping themselves because they think they're going to lose the position. They don't say anything. 
The inspectors are doing the same, and basically bad behaviour breeds bad behaviour. If I had said something out of place or done something out of place, I'd have been pulled over, you know, straight in the office. Everyone knows I've got a bollocking. Jesus, don't do that again, you know. Um, now it's just allowed to happen, and the sergeants join in with it. And and the, and the thing is that behaviours, you know, and the public, you know, we see complaints all the time about police, which I'm sure it's yourself, but it breaks my heart because I'm not it like does. that. I was never like that. And everyone's slagging off the police. And it's not every police officer. But no, is there an element of that? Absolutely, there is, massively. You know, I see it. I see homophobic behaviour, misogynic behaviour, racism. Is it there? Yes, unfortunately it is. It wasn't yeah. there. Honestly, I can hand on heart say, in my 24 years, until the last probably five or so years, it wasn't a thing. It really wasn't. People weren't racist. They weren't homophobic. They, yeah, you get the odd thing. It's going to happen. Of course it will, because you can't. But as an organisation, it wasn't that. Mm. And now it's allowed to breed to be that. And the standards, I mean, you, you go into every office, they've got these bloody great posters up saying, speak out, say this, do this. And it looks as if they're doing the right thing, you, you think. But the problem is, if you raise, I mean, <laughs> it's colleague of me, you may see this, okay? But he come up with a great thing, and this is so true. You see a bad behaviour, you raise that bad behaviour, you are the bad behaviour. Yeah, exactly. The problem, you raise that problem, you're now the problem. Yeah, absolutely and right. That's the problem. That they're not looking at the source of that problem. They're looking at who brought that problem up. Um, so people don't bring it up. Why would you? No, but, but because it's easier to keep your head down. It is. I mean, just that's the thing. Keep your gob shut, your eyes closed, your ears closed, and ignore stuff. And if you ignore stuff, guess what? You're never going to be in any trouble. But I'm a bit old fashioned, I'm afraid, and I would deal with things head on. And uh, you know, there's people that will be listening to this. And I, if you work for me. And, not, and you cause me a problem, I will call you in and deal with you there and then. There wouldn't be a PSD referral no. unless, you, unless you've broken the law. I would deal with that as a management action, management advice, whatever, there and then. That does happen. That's and it doesn't happen. I know it doesn't happen. I know. I hear, I get, you know, I get phone calls on a regular basis. But anyway, listen, I'd like to thank you for your candor, sir. Um, you're now running your own business. Yeah. Now, what I will say is have a look at my website, um, xjobservices.com, yeah. okay, because you can advertise on their free of charge on a point of entry. There is a paid bit where you can put all your videos and all that sort of stuff. But have a look at that and stick yeah. your business on there because it's a, it's a central repository for nice people, basically. Okay, and we've got other other people that do medical training. But what do you actually do now? Um, I've got pretty much three roles, I guess. And so I... I mean, last week I was training um, close protection um, uh, threat free course, so it's a advanced first aid course yep. for uh, close protection people, subcontracting. Um, the weekend I was on uh, doing event work, so uh, ambulance company I work for, that's really good, enjoy that. And then um, the rest of the time I work for a, a, an office based company, really, it paid me very nicely, and um, yeah, lovely place to work, really nice place to work. So Brilliant. yeah. It's all, it's all good. Brilliant. Well, look, as I say, have a look at the website, and if I can help you, I will. Um, please send me your email. I will. I, will look, I look forward to reading that. Um, I will share this round. I've got some people I know in British Transport Police, and hopefully you'll get a response that is um, suitable. And that I think will... with me, if you don't mind, sorry, to very quick. No, go on. Um, I was very disappointed, to be fair. I think what got me was the lack of interest, as in I brought something to you. Now, Towards my end, I was a little bit bulletproof because I could walk out any day because I've gone past yeah. my retirement date. Um, although I stayed on for a little bit, I stayed on purely because the pension was a bit better. I stayed on a few months but longer. However, I could have walked out, you know, put me through grave, I just walk out the door. Um, I emailed the chief constable, I emailed my area commander, chief superintendent, and I emailed P PSD, um, special stands department. I didn't get a response for any of them three at all, nothing. Now, the area commander must have got it because he got his deputy to have a meeting with me, although nothing come of that. Um, so that was quite disappointing because, you know, I wasn't just in two minutes and walked out the door. I didn't cause a problem walk out the door. I never wanted this to be a problem. No. I wanted to raise issues. You're asking me to, everyone to raise issues. And then when someone's able to, because they can, but a lot of people and cops are serving, serving now cannot raise issues. They've got mortgages, they've got careers. You know, they cannot have their head above the parapet 
No. They're not allowed to do it. Well, they, they can do it, but they're just going to get shot. So why would you? some problems, yeah. Um, I did. And what really, really, and I'm going to say the word, pissed me off, that I got nothing. Yeah, at yeah. all, nothing. It was it was radio silence. And again, when I left when I left the army, okay, so I was at uh, uh, 156 in Colchester. I'm leaving yeah. the army. My lieutenant, um, lieutenant colonel, um, brought me in, literally. I'd only met the guy probably once or twice. Yeah. You know, and he sat me down, cup of tea. How can I get you to stay? You know, you're a good guy. Really wants to keep you. Blah blah blah. I said, look, you know, I'm leaving. Blah. And he said, look. Here's my here's my off, my office number here. If any time you want to come back in the next six months, call me. I'll get you straight back. Done. When I left Hertfordshire, area commander again, uh, um, uh, chief superintendent got me in. Cup of tea, sit down. How can we get to say? You don't want me to go. It's been there five years. I only walked out once. You know. Again, when I left BTP, I got an email that basically threatened me. Yeah, there's a couple of bits on there quite threatening that I couldn't speak to media. I wasn't allowed to go do this, do that. I can't do this. What we're doing now, we're not allowed to. Yeah. Well, who, I said, who says you can't do it? Well, exactly. Where is it? I can't do that. Do not give me 24 years and send me a bloody email. You know, no oh, one can I have a copy? Can I have a copy of that email as well? So, have you still got it? No, because it will work. Uh, I may have. If I find it, I'll, I'll send it. Yeah, send I it. Don't know. it. Know. It's generic email, it's, so anyone that's left BTP will get it. Okay, so speak to anyone that's left. They've probably all got it. Okay, generic email. And, and the thing they, you know, they these things are, you must do this, you've got to hand this in, do that. To, yeah, fair enough. I've got the admin. But when you actually read into it, there's a couple of threats in there. I didn't like that. I thought, no. start, and I actually put it in my email, and you'll see it when I send it to you. Don't threaten me, okay? Don't threaten me. I'm my own person now. What are they going to do? Take me to court, you got me for libel. Okay, what have I lied about there? Adam. So everything I'm talking to you about, have talked to you, is true. Okay, so you can't, yeah, and, that, and that's you can't, exactly you can't defame someone if it's not true. Yeah, and the rest of it, you, know, you can't talk about operational stuff. Okay, what have I talked about? It's operational here. A couple of incidents, but are they specific? Could you say it happened at this place at this time that day? This family included? No, don't threaten me. And, and, and that left a real sour taste in my mouth. Oh. The whole thing was just basically 24 years. Do you know what, mate? Do one. Well, I'm going to conclude this interview now. And okay. before I say anything else, is there anything you'd like to add or to or correct in relation to this interview today? No, not at all. No. no. You've been amazing. Thank you. No, thank you. And I hope that, you know, it's been cathartic for you to, to talk it through. But uh, I'm going to say cheerio. Okay, but thank you. All right, mate. Take care. God bless. And I'll speak to you soon. Thank you for listening to this episode of X Job Download. Please like, follow, and share. Your support is invaluable. Thank you.